Hello! Look at no makeup melt. She's so stunning! I am so excited for this weekend. Cannot even tell you. Hello, recording friends. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. My name is Mel and I'm over excited about this. So you guys know how much I love readathons. I've been loving readathons for the past two years. However, I am so used to starting readathons in the nighttime that I've always wondered what if I start a readathon in the morning and still read for 24 or 48 hours, however long it is, and compare the productivity one versus the other. I am here for this experiment. I am here to try this out and see what potentially comes of it. However, everything comes with a twist because not only am I going to be starting this in the morning, which I've never done, but also I will only be timing myself when I read and I can only stop the clock once I've reached 24 hours. And now the hope is that I will complete these 24 hours this weekend. And I have a TBR, so let me show you. This right here is my TBR for the next 48 hours and I am so excited for this. So let me run you down these books. First of all, We've got All Roads Lead here by Mariana Zapata, and this is a buddy read with Liv. Don't know how much of this will actually get done, or I don't know how much she wants to get done of this book, but hopefully we'll be starting this at some point of the readathon and reading this together. And then my best friends decided to just build me a TBR because I was so indecisive. That was just all vibes, and they nailed it, I think, because they chose Gods of Jane and Shadow by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Seasonal Fears by Shauna Maguire. I've been super intimidated by this book, mostly just because I absolutely adore middle game. And the Maidens by Alex Michaelides. Michaelides, yes. But I'm so, so excited for this to be our the next 48 hours to time myself and to see how many books I can actually finish in a timed 24 hours where I'm actually reading. Let's get it. Let's get started. I'm very excited. Alright friends, welcome to the first update of the vlog. Let me just do a little hour check-in just so that we're on the same page here. So we've been at the readathon for five hours and 40 minutes, of which I've been reading for two hours and 40 minutes. So technically about half the time is what I've been reading. And if the math maths, it doesn't. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But like that feels like half the time to me. Anyways, so I have been reading Seasonal Fears and this is not <laughs> what I expected at all. I thought this would be very similar to Middle Game if you don't know middle game it essentially explores this idea of what happens if kids are born with powers and they're created under very just very specific conditions by alchemists in order to develop those powers as they grow up and adopt and become the incarnate version of the doctrine of ethos so that they can then become gods that's essentially how it goes and so in middle game we follow twins i thought we would be following twins also in seasonal fears but we don't we actually follow best friends slash couple named Melanie and Harry. It's definitely throwing me off that the main character also has my name because Harry just keeps calling her Mel and uh, it's just throwing me off uh, for a loop there. This is not remotely similar to Middle Game, which I appreciate because it stands on its own and it's doing its own thing. But instead of being all about numbers and literature, Seasonal Fears is much more about seasons. Haha. <laughs> so essentially, Melanie is potential candidate for becoming the incarnate for winter. And then on the opposite end, you've got Harry, who is the candidate candidate or one of to become the incarnate of summer. Now the idea behind this book is what happens if the seasons or all of these my mystical entities of some sort, so the moon, the sun, the seasons, actually are enticed enough to become a person themselves. And I mean it's kind of the same as middle game but I think in this book it's explained much more thoroughly than in middle game and I think that was part of the appeal of middle game that although you understood what was happening there was still this sort of mystic 
cynicism towards how it was happening. I think seasonal fears just kind of lays it out for you where it says, you know, all of these alchemists have built these people from scratch and the idea was to make somebody so perfect that again, these seasons or these mystical entities would be enticed towards essentially possessing their bodies and becoming human. Not necessarily human, but people. And then turns out that humanity warps them into a different thing just because it's something that they've never experienced as a thing, so to say. And so it's interesting, I guess in the same way that middle game was interesting because of the whole doctrine thing and achieving the impossible city. So this is still the same end result, just by different means. And so the whole premise of the book is essentially these two people who are candidates competing against the other candidates to see exactly who will attain the crown. And essentially the two rulers of every other season are winter and summer. And so it's like this cutthroat Hunger Games within middle game moment, but it's nowhere near as exciting. Let me backtrack. I shouldn't say that it's nowhere near as exciting. I just don't think the writing and the execution is what I loved from middle game. It's very different. And although there's still this cyclical nature to the writing, and although the writing is still very much like, what the fuck is happening sometimes, where it's full of contradictions and different roads and different avenues all leading to the same thing. I think it's the time element maybe of middle game that was so appealing to me, where if you've read middle game, then you know that time is a big part of it, right? Of Roger and Dodger potentially getting things wrong and resetting their timeline. And I don't know, I feel like that just gave it an extra oomph. Whereas this is very linear. I don't know. I'm just like not clicking with it as much, even though I am a third of the way through. So I am 155 pages in. It's not making me want to eat it up in the same way that I ate middle game up. I will say it's been satisfying to see the tidbits from middle game being mentioned in this book. So although it is a direct continuation of middle game, yes, motorcycle, it is not the same thing. Like it is a sequel, but it's also a standalone. So that part I do like, I like the tidbits without the blatant spoilers from middle game, which I again appreciate. Overall, I think this is making me want to reread middle game more than it's making me want to read this book, which is not necessarily a good thing. So there's that. There is that. I will say also the most interesting character to me is not even Harry or Melanie. I think the relationship is like fine. There is something to be said about Harry's almost need or want to possess her. Like it's, it's this weird thing where he says like, I'm not possessive. And then Melanie goes, well, he's not that possessive. Like he's possessive in all the ways that count. But then he just keeps saying, like he just keeps reaffirming her in a very possessive language of like my Melanie, my Mel, my this, my that. I will say my favorite character is the dad. And I think he's the most interesting character because of how he loves his two daughters. I think that's the most interesting part because he doesn't love them in the conventional way. And I think it's just that, that messed up aspect of it, which makes it so interesting where he loves them because he created them and because he created them in a very specific particular way, but not necessarily because they're his daughters. Like he reveres them because he's like, they're my creation. They will end up being like the queens of everything. They will be summer and winter incarnate. And I did that. So it's an interesting kind of fucked up love, which I am finding super interesting to read about. Also just because he is very controlling because of the circumstances. And that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm going to switch books. And you know what? I'm going to take a break from this whole mysticism thing because all of my TBR is essentially mystical. And I'm going to read a little bit of All Roads Lead here. Also just because Liv is reading it right now and she's making it sound mad good. So I'm going to start this. Fantastic. And listen, now that we're here, we're just going to open two fair loot boxes that I have right here. I've got the June, I think, July. Yes, no, the July YA box. And then I have the July adult box. Okay, so I'm starting out with the smaller one, which is the adult fair loot. Demigods and donuts, which I love the graphic for this. It's so, so cute. Let's open this and let's see the book in Parson. So this is backwards. The book is The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by Megan Bannon. True love might be the death of them. This is a really, really stunning cover, but look, just look at these. It's the sprayed stenciled edges that just blew me away. Oh my God, wait, this is so cute. Cute. The end papers, that is so freaking wholesome. So is this, is this like a romance? Is this not a fantasy? So The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by Megan Bannon is filled with laugh out loud moments and a romance that will tug out your heartstrings. It's a unique and joyful read. The foil embossing, oh, there's a foil embossing on the hardcover, was designed by 
Eclipsion, and the artwork on the end papers are also done by the same artist. And then it's also signed by the author. Let's look at the foiling. <gasps> you are joking. You're joking. That is like ridiculous. Fairy moon. That is really pretty. Okay, let's read a synopsis for this. Hart is a marshal tasked with patrolling the magical wild of Tanria. Okay, so it is a fantasy. Just based on these pictures, I would have never guessed. Okay, it's an unforgiving job and Hart's got nothing but time to ponder his loneliness. Mercy never has a moment to herself. She's been single-handedly keeping Birdsall and Son undertakers afloat in defiance of sullen jerks like Hart, who seem to have a gift for showing up right when her patient is thinnest. After yet another exasperating run-in with Mercy, Hart finds himself penning a letter addressed simply to a friend. Much to his surprise, an anonymous letter comes back in return, and a tentative friendship is born. If only Hart knew he's been bearing his soul to the person who infuriates him the most, Mercy. As the dangers from Tanria grow closer, so do the unlikely pen pals. But can their blossoming romance survive the fated discovery that their correspondents are their worst nightmares to each other? That is so cute, and I love that it's like very romance, but it's still a fantasy. Hi, Vin. Hi, Mama. I think this will be very, very good for the Fair Loot YA box. Also, I will be leaving Fair Loot's website linked down below in case you guys want to sign up to their wait list. I completely forgot what the theme is for this month, and I have no idea what the book is. So, you know, there's that. But the theme is Trials and Retribution. So, we, I just hear straws. So, we're gonna fetch for these first. I literally have a whole nook right there with Vin in there. Hello. So, this is your official YouTube introduction, Bubba. So, I got another cat. Hello. If you follow me on Instagram, you'd know. And if you don't follow me on Instagram, you should. But this is Syl. Obviously, keeping like the Stormlight Mistborn theme. But this is her. She's a baby. She's a cuddler. Hello, cats. Anyways, what I was saying, I've got a nook back there with chopsticks and straws and everything. So, this is going to be perfect for my collection. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it on camera also just because I can't really tell if you can see. But there is this pattern going. I love that they included a brush to clean them. That's really, really nice. And this, yeah, it's a Greek pattern. It's designed by Team Fairy Loot. It's fandom neutral. So I will be putting these on my sink and we're gonna wash them later. Okay, the next thing I see here is peeking out of the little bag. And oh my God, this is like so intense. Like, what is this? This is a dagger of some kind, but it's, it's the finger thing, like... <laughs> Like what? <laughs> Never mind. This is a collectible letter opener. And this is inspired not by Lila. Fairy Loot, I love you, but I don't like Shades of Magic. Inspired by a darker shade of magic by V.E. Schwab. And this was designed by Jess Hawk. Listen, it's pretty. It's very, very pretty. I love socks. And these are inspired by Gideon the Ninth. So let's take this little thing off. We can see on one side we've got like deadish leaves. And oh my god, it's so fussy on the inside. <gasps> That's nice. We We've got a little skull. We've got a pin flag, which is inspired, if I had to guess, by Dance of Thieves. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. Yes, so this is inspired by Dance of Thieves by Mary E. Pearson, and this was designed by Blanca Dot Design. Oh my god, wait. <gasps> yes, it's a print album. Yes. I'm so excited. So this was designed by Chatty Nora and it is a print album, meaning that we can just put all of our art prints that come in the Fairlude boxes in here. And I appreciate it because my art prints are literally everywhere. It's gonna be great to put everything in and then just put it as a false book moment on the bookshelves potentially. Tarot cards, we've got the Hermit and String. I'm not quite sure who these characters are, but we're gonna find out with a spoiler card. However, that being said, they are Fucking stunning. Uh, this is, ooh, this is from Blood Scion. Okay. And the art is by ARZ28, like always. Ugh, I still, I will say this forever. I love the backing of these cards so freaking much. So we got the bookmark that always comes with the boxes that is, again, the same as the spoiler card. And then we've got the letter from the author, which always doubles as an art print. And, ooh, this is like very gray. It's like very, very like monotone. What's happening? What is this? The book? The darkening. I don't know why this cover is giving me like the merciful crow vibes. I've never even read that book. Mm, but this is The Darkening by Sunya Mara. And we've got, ooh, 
I thought these were gonna be blocked braid edges based on the top. Ooh, we've got some nice leaves on the edge. Oh my God, this is so pretty. What? Is this an angel? Oh my God, we've got this end paper. And then towards the back, we've got one more. We've got this at the back, this foiling with the title of the book. Prince Dalka was born for one purpose, to protect his home from the storm, a deadly force that surrounds his city and curses everyone it touches. Vesper Vale is the daughter of failed revolutionaries. Since the queen sentenced her mother to death by the storm, she and her father have been on the run. That rhymed. So when the queen's soldiers, led by Prince Dalka, catch up to Vesper's father, she will do whatever it takes to save him from sharing her mother's cruel fate, she even arm herself with her father's book of dangerous experimental magic, she even infiltrate the prince's elite squad of soldier sorcerers, she even cheat her way into his cold heart. But when Vesper learns that there is more to the story of her mother's death and that home is in dire peril, she has little choice. Trust the devious prince with her family secrets or follow her mother's footsteps into the storm. I have to say, that sounds super cool. And I think Fairloot has been nailing it lately with books I've never heard of. And it's just like a very personal thing because I know like people have heard of these books, but I've never heard of this book. I never heard of this Vicious Grace. So I think they've been nailing it lately. And also for that matter, the undertaking of Heart and Mercy too. Y'all, it's my favorite time of day. You know what time it is? Buckies, 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 buckies. Guess who's got the update? Hello. So it is nighttime and it's currently 11:36, and I don't have my phone. I need to do an hour check-in. Hold up, BRB. But I've been reading all the roads leave here. Okay, so almost 14 hours into the readathon, and I have read for five hours and 32 minutes, which, all things considered, is not that bad. This book is so good. So Liv started this before I did because I was reading Seasonal Fears. She is, I think, about a hundred pages to being done. In this book, we've got Aurora, and Aurora is moving back to Colorado, which is where she grew up with her mom. She is moving back there to experience things that her mom did. Her mom was a big hiker. She was a big outdoorsy person, and she wants to experience all those things that her mom loved. Now, the reason why she doesn't get to do those things with her mom, though, is because her mom went missing 20 years ago and she was never found and the investigation was just closed due to not having any significant findings for the investigation but she essentially went missing one day hiking and they never saw her again and so she wants to connect to her mom a little bit more and she thinks the best way of doing that is through experiencing once more the things that her mom loved so she ends up moving back not only for that reason but also because she wants to start her life anew she feels like she has been making the wrong decisions or sort of quote-unquote wasting time Time, but not really on the wrong relationships on the wrong people and really getting sort of the shit end of the stick a lot of the time in that moment she decides to rent a garage apartment that is up for rent obviously and she does so except that she gets there and she figures out that the person who owns the house actually didn't put it up for rent it was his son that did his 14 year old son and very reluctantly he allows aurora to stay in the garage in the garage and that is sort of where the story goes and develops he is very much not wanting anything to do with her he is like if you even breathe the same air as me we will have an issue i better not hear you i better not see you the only thing i want to remotely see is your car everything else i don't want any reminder of your existence around my house i don't care if you're staying in my backyard and so again he doesn't want to do anything with her and i almost wonder still at this point why exactly he doesn't want that like why exactly is he so standoffish to people staying in the garage apartment because it's a big thing in the book that everybody keeps reaffirming he's letting you stay there and so i want to know what exactly happened that has made him this way or if it's just a person trade at this point. I'm not quite sure as of now, as of where I'm at right now in the book. It's a single parent trope, obviously, which I absolutely love. I am very happy to announce that they do bond and they bond over music, which I absolutely love. And she is so encouraging and just so, uh, I don't know, I feel like she's an amazing presence in his life because we don't really get to observe Rhodes' dynamic with Amos, who's his son. We only really get to see the tail end of it when she gets to interact with them, but we don't really know how they behave without her present, if that makes sense. So I don't know really how Rhodes is with his son. So I love that she's like this preppy, really positive, really reaffirming just presence in his life. I think I love that balance of him being like the serious one and her being like the chaotic, let's do it kind of person.
person. I love it. She very much gives me Elle Woods vibes. Not in like the, you know, underestimated blonde sort of way, but much more in the, I have been undermined. And I mean, I guess it's kind of the same, but without the blonde part, but she's been a person that clearly has been put down a lot throughout her life. And it's really impacting the way that she even sees herself. And so because she feels so inadequate a lot of the time, she is going the extra mile to learn things, even if she's not that interested in them, but she really is a kind person and that shines through her actions a lot. And so even if people are like, why would you want to learn that? Like, like, I don't think you'd be interested in that. She's like, no, I want to learn. And so I love that goal getter attitude that, you know, you can underestimate me all you want, but I will do it. I will make it there. And it very much, again, is giving me those Elwoods vibes because not only that, not only is she a goal getter, but also her attitude is just like, again, very preppy, very upbeat, very just, oh my God, yeah which I honestly kind of say like I really really do love that and so character wise I'm having a really great time I also love how for really the majority of like what I've read which is essentially half the book by now almost he has barely uttered like 30 words her way like it's really been very minimal and when he finally does talk to her and he's starting to like warm up but he doesn't want to show that y'all it's like the little smiles and like the little side eye and just being extra observant even though he doesn't want it to come across that way but you can tell he's watching and I just read a scene in which he called her angel and I could not handle it okay he laughed and he called her angel in the same scene listen it's the little things in life and also I'm really not into the pet names of like babe baby no shame if you do like you know to each their own but I personally don't like it so I'm, I'm much more into like the sweetheart angel vibes and he is he is giving all of that and more and I am very much here for it and so I love this it's very chaotic but it's very entertaining and reads very easily which I think is perfect for a readathon and I think because you're so invested in seeing them even make the slightest bit of progress in their relationship and just actually start conversations it's something that you just want to keep reading to see when that's actually going to pan out in the story because it doesn't feel slow but you know that the relationship is moving slow given that he is very not into her presence so I am loving this it is so much a vibe there's also a scene where her car breaks down and she starts swearing she's like fuck 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 and he's like did that work insulting your car did that work for you like did she like magically fix herself and just like you know turn on and she's like no she really doesn't answer to like degradation or like bullying or whatever she says and he's like open your trunk and she's like what and he's like open your trunk I don't got all day it's that again that reluctance to get along with her but him always extending a hand and like doing things again very reluctantly but it's so good it's so 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 good and then also her best friend Yuki I absolutely love her she is like very witchy like very it's like energy and the vibes I absolutely love her she literally at one point she's like I'll send him a crystal through your PO box I got you let him put that on the left side of his body and then you you know you do some aging and you cleanse yourself and I'm like yes girl and just also music being such a big part of this and also such a big part of the conflict in her past so fascinating because she is a songwriter but she's never credited for anything and it seems that she has helped a lot of very famous important people and also her ex-boyfriend she calls him ex-husband but like big red flag this man called her wife behind the scenes but he would never like he never married her first of all he never got married and second of all he said <coughs> not me choking see I'll marry you when I'm famous enough that people don't care who I'm with or like my fans don't care she really put up with that for 14 years anyways this is great I'm having a fantastic time this is funny I'm gonna eat and then I'm gonna read and I am going to eat this up and I'm going to finish this sound listen friends I tried my absolute hardest to stay up and be team no sleep however it is let me show you it is 3 38 a.m it's super late and I'm super tired like my eyes are literally closing on their own as I read but I have read for a Eight hours and 22 minutes with 53 seconds 69 nanoseconds and I'm literally a hundred pages away finishing all roads lead here so what I'm thinking I'm gonna do is literally go to bed till like 7 30 in the morning then wake up and finish that as soon as I'm up so I think that'll be the plan I think that's the vibe but just know I'm loving this I'm loving this because there is zero miscommunication well there's one part that Aurora is not being like full honest with is it really a lie or is it just like i'm not ready to tell you about my drama yet so you know all things considered it could be worse but otherwise it's super cute he's calling her angel and sweetheart and it's everything i've ever wanted and all of the outdoorsy stuff just fits so perfectly and just the sense of family between her 
Rhodes and his son that they're developing. It's like their own little like bubble. I just find it incredibly wholesome and I love it so much. And I love how he's so assertive too. And like she reciprocates that where he's like, listen, I'm into you. But until we both figure out what it is that we want and what we're here for, this is not happening. And so we're gonna take it as slow as humanly possible. And so I absolutely love that. And she's okay with that too. So it's not an issue. Straightforward communication in a story. It is great to witness. And I also really love what she did with Amos's mom. I thought it was gonna be like this whole tragic thing about, you know, her not being around and like this, you know, like drama. But actually it was very wholesome too. And the circumstances of Rhodes having a kid were just like super beautiful and wholesome and I love it so much. I love this. I love this all around. It's like a very cozy, homey feel and it's definitely giving me like safe haven vibes. So I'm here for it and that was all I wanted. So yes, motorcycle. So I'm gonna go sleep for a little bit and I shall see you when I am awake and ready to read some more. morning friends hi <laughs> so it is saturday the 13th it is 10 30 a.m just for a checkup so we are officially 24 hours into the readathon and you know what all things considered i think i'm doing pretty great i have been reading for 10 hours so literally just up the timer 10 hours and 30 seconds it's almost about halfway through the 24 which is exactly where i wanted to be and i think i might be able to do this by like tomorrow at noon or maybe a little bit before to have read for a full 24 hours. So quite proud of myself. And also just the fact alone that in 10 hours I have read, <clears throat> let's do a page count, shall we? So I just finished All Roads Lead Here and this was 560 pages plus the 155 I've read of Seasonal Fears. That's like 710 pages around that number. She's doing pretty good. However, I just finished All Roads Lead Here and and I cried. I cried. It was really, really wholesome and it was really cute. I think the integration of grief as a theme in this book, not the cats wanting to drop my camera, Miss Ma'am. The inclusion of grief as a theme in this book just worked so well. And I think in the way that it was executed, it felt so different to what I've read in the past. I feel like typically books that talk about grief, it's something that's very recent. In this, the loss of Aurora's mother happened 20 years in the past. So she has had a really long time to heal and although all the wounds aren't yet fully closed you can tell that she has come to terms really with what happened and what her life looks like now and even though she'd like answers for certain things that you know have been left unanswered for so long she half accepts the fact that some things really can't be changed and some things just happen the way that they do and I really love that attitude in her I love this I just can't change some things and some things again will happen in the way that they do and I really have no control over them so let me not fret over it. My anxiety could never, okay? <laughs> I could never. And when we actually descended into the conversation of grief and holding on to pieces of people and, and them taking a piece of you with them and allowing yourself to feel all those emotions and, and that really not being a disservice to who you are and who they were, but really just acknowledging the fact that they played such a big role in your life and that's what grief meant to her. It was so heartbreakingly beautiful. That I was just out here in the club crying and it was it was very very emotional but I had a good time and just the sense of found family I guess you could say with Aurora you know coming into this family for Rhodes and Amos and just you know rebuilding the the sense of family that these two had and oh it was just beautiful I just I love single parent stories and I think this was done so well because it was so unconventional too again in the way that Rhodes had Amos I, I just think it was really really stunning 
stunning all around. It was just genuinely a story full of love, but also almost like the uncertainty to love, right? That there's this reluctance in all of these characters to wholly embrace one another and being able to admit like, I love you. Like all of these people are guarded. All of these people have these defenses up because they don't want to be hurt. And so especially with Rhodes having a kid, I think it, it obviously puts up a higher barrier as to what he is willing to do because he doesn't want to hurt his son. And there is many a regret, it seems like, and many, many a yearning also with decisions made in the past and Rhodes having to sacrifice so much of his life and his career in order to be present for his son, which just... I just hit so hard and I don't know I just like stories about parenthood and I think this definitely did not disappoint and Aurora as a character still do not throw my camera to the ground please and thank you I just love stories about people that feel real and about parenthood and I think this nailed both and I think also what I will say is that these people like genuinely feel like people even down to <laughs> Rhodes hating on Caden I didn't agree with him like insulting Caden half as much as he did but it's true, like sometimes when you're talking to your friends or your loved ones and, and you were wronged by somebody or somebody did something that, you know, ended up harming you in some way or hurting you in some way, I think it's only natural for people to react that way, even though, again, I disagree with all of this slander. But, you know, I, I just think they all read like people and even also Aurora with trying to make people happy and trying to be present and just being comforting and being so kind. I just love the way that these kids characters were constructed. I just had a really, really good time. And I like the fact that this was slow burn, but it wasn't the type of slow burn that like happened in the last 20 pages because that's kind of what happened with From Look Up With Love. I really appreciated the fact that we got at least like a hundred pages of them actually being together or building towards being together. Obviously, the dynamics are very much different and I appreciated the change in dynamic in this book. It was quite nice. So I really liked this and I'm rating this four stars. It was really, really fun and I liked it a lot. So first book of the readathon is done. I'm about to have some breakfast and potentially finish Seasonal Fears and just go from there. Hello friends, this is another update for the vlog. Hello. I don't know why I said it like that. It's obviously an update, but hi. It is currently 3.34, there you go, 3.34 p.m. And let me show you my timer. I am officially halfway through the 24 hours. I am right smack the middle at 12 hours and we're gonna do the damn thing. It's gonna take longer than I anticipated, but listen. It's gonna happen, okay? So I have sprints with Liv in 30 minutes, roughly. I mean, a little under 30 minutes. And so the hope is to finish middle game by then and then move on to the next book. I'm a little bit over halfway through of, did I say middle game? Seasonal fears, pretty sure I said middle game. Anyway, yes, I'm a little bit over halfway through. I am currently 265 pages into this. And let me just say, <laughs> This book is like the saddest turn of events ever. Not because the book is sad, but because I'm not enjoying it. And I, exactly, the book just fell on me. Yeah, this is just not, not having a good time, you guys. And I am so very disappointed in this because I think the beauty of middle game in a lot of ways is that sense of urgency, that sense of inevitability that the plot has, and also the fact that the tone itself for the story beyond the time element of it and how a lot of things are inescapable is very melancholic and very poetic and it has again like the twinge of like fate and destiny and things that you can't really help because it's so much bigger than you and even though this is somewhat urgent because there is this competition this coronation that will eventually decide who will become the incarnate for summer and winter there is isn't as much urgency as middle game had and listen i wouldn't be comparing these two books but this is a continuation of middle game and roger and dodger are even in here at the point where i'm at in the book this is you know they're currently interacting with roger and dodger and even roger and dodger seems so out of character that it's actually unreal like i'm actually the more i read this the less i like it and i didn't think it'd go like that and i feel like that's a big thing for me for a book that needs to feel so urgent 
intelligent because it's like this Hunger Games style competition where they need to continually eliminate each other to see who the end all be all is going to be. It doesn't feel very urgent. There have been moments that have felt very grandiose, that have felt very action packed, but those are really few and far in between and everything else is just kind of chill. Like they literally are just like vibing and they're like, ah, it's fine. Although I'm curious to know what happens to them. They could drop dead right now and I genuinely would not care. Like I care more about Jack Frost in this book, which is another one of the characters that we have. She is the ascendant essentially. And she is the person that guides winter or a potential winter incarnate towards getting the crown. And so she is helping Melanie get there. And she is by far the best part of this book. She is physically 13, but she doesn't talk like a 13 year old, which is just hilarious to me. So she is literally the best part of this book, but everything else is not, it's just not the vibe. Even the way that the book starts, I think is so jarring in comparison to middle game. I will just read you kind of the last bit of the prologues, I guess you could call them for seasonal fears and middle game so that you guys can understand the difference in writing. And so that I can illustrate just a little bit better, even with just a small passage, exactly why this feels so tonally different. It feels like they don't even belong in the same series, if I'm being honest. So, no, she says, sounding surprised for the first time. The fight is not required. We are not so easily dethroned as all that you fought as these people do not. And so they were unprepared to stand before you. And when the contenders for the summer saw what they would have to stand beside if they were chosen, they laid down their own potential and stepped out of my way. This is not our continent. This is not our country. These should not be our crowns. They will be. They will, because you have left no others to hold the winter, she snarls. And in that moment, she is a beast, and he realizes that the color of her skin doesn't betray the content of her heart. He has not defeated the savages to take his rightful place. One of them stands beside him to be yoked to him for all of time. You will manifest, and I will manifest with you, because no one will stand by your side. They know the summer must be held, but they will not hold it in concert with a killer. But you will. I will do what I must for summer's sake, and endure your company long as our fates demand. She stands a little straighter. The mal is not leaving her eyes. Your reign will not be long. William thinks of the alchemist who came to him at the start of the crowning, the one who offered him victory and a measureless reign if only he would consider the needs of the newly formed American Alchemical Congress and his choices in his guidance of the season that is his birthright. He turns the man down at the time, but the situation, it seems, has changed. His reign will be eternal. So that is the end of the first section of Seasonal Fears. And now for a dramatic reading of the end of of the prologue for middle game. <laughs> I'm so very excited about this. Her eyes are closed. There's so much blood. There's one thing he can do. Maybe the only thing. Maybe it was always the only thing and they've been building toward this the whole time. It feels like failure, like running back to the garden and he doesn't care because her chest is barely moving and there's so much blood. There's so much blood blood and it doesn't matter that he knows the words, all the words for everything. The numbers are taking her away. He can't reach them without her. I can't do this alone. I'm sorry. I can't. He leans in until his lips brush the seashell curve of her ear. There's blood in her hair, turning it tacky and clinging. It, it sticks to his skin and he doesn't try to wipe it off. Dodger, he whispers, don't die. This is an order. This is a command. This is an adjuration. Do whatever you have to do. Break whatever you have to break, but don't you die. This is an order. This is. This is her eyes opening. Pupils reduced to black pinpricks against the gray of her irises until she looks like she suffered a massive opiate overdose. This is gold sparking in the gray, brief and bright as the impossible city tries to call her home. Feels the gold in his own bones respond, reaching for the golden dodgers, yearning to reunite. This is the sound of gunfire going silent, not tapering off, just stopping. Like the world has been muted. This is the world going white. This is the end. We got it wrong. We got it wrong. We got it wrong. We got it wrong. We. I'm sorry. How? How in the world are these two books related? They're not. I refuse to believe that after writing this masterpiece, literally my favorite book of all time, this is what I get for a sequel. It just, it seems like a cruel joke. <laughs> it kind of does.
Hello friends. It is currently raining. It's a vibe. It is also 11.20 p.m. just for a timestamp. The readathon will be over technically in 12 hours. But, well, a little bit under 12 hours, but I am still on hour 15 with 28 minutes. So still technically have nine hours to go of this readathon that I will knock out between tonight and then tomorrow. And we'll see how that goes. However, let me update you because I have finished the second book of the readathon and I genuinely do not know how I went from reading my favorite book of all time I mean in the same series as this to then rating seasonal fear as one star but this was just not it and here's the thing I think for a book that emphasizes so much the connection between Melanie and Harry so much and this is essentially all revolving around their dynamic their chemistry their love for each other and how they are in parallel in a way that they shouldn't be based on the premise of this book naturally some and winter do not get along and so it's a big point of this book how these two people are not the norm how they will reign probably in the best way possible that they've seen in centuries if not like thousands of years but I did not feel an ounce of that chemistry also y'all are in the cat tower probably the worst place to put you in because the cats are currently playing however I did not feel an ounce of that chemistry it borderlined on obsession particularly on Harry's end he kept reaffirming in very possessive language his Melanie, my Melanie, in a way that didn't feel entirely right to me, especially because, and here's the thing, I can vibe with some possessiveness if done right, but because I never felt the chemistry between these two characters, I really didn't like the possessiveness in this because it felt proprietary in a way that it probably shouldn't have. And I understand what Shauna Maguire was going for, right? It's the whole destiny, this whole faded situation that it's almost inevitable for these two people to end up together based on their circumstances and how they grew up and particularly Mel's also circumstances with her twin sister who allegedly passed away when she was super, super young. And so it was extremely frustrating to read about this couple that was supposed to be the end all be all they were supposed to be crowned king and queen of winter and summer and yet the chemistry that was so reinforced in the book i never got to observe and on top of that the moments that we did get i found incredibly cringy i think if this book would have had the same tone writing wise as middle game a romance would have been phenomenal because middle game still has a romantic tone to it even though it's not a romance at all and i think it's this idea of this unconditional love behind a set of twins right and so if it would have had that beautiful prose, very poetic, very just deep and existential, I guess like you could say, if it would have had that type of prose, I would have fallen in love with Harry and Mel, and yet I didn't, and I think that was one of the most frustrating parts of this. I also think the fact that this story is very linear worked against it, in my opinion. One of the most incredible parts of Middle Game is the fact that because you are playing with time and because Roger and Dodger are constantly resetting time, Middle Game does not play very linear nearly, although parts of it do, there are many resets in time to fix points in time. And so in middle game, we constantly go back and forth in time, which I found incredibly immersive because you're just constantly wondering, are they going to make it? Are they going to make it in time? And you just kind of have to read on to figure it out. But with this, it's this trek onwards. For a book that is painfully, obviously building up to the competition aspect that is so big in this, because literally the whole thing is like set up to be a Hunger Games mode. And the competition is not even a part of the book. Like, it seems like the book builds up to nothing. And listen, I will make this comparison and I will make it proudly because for the girlies who get it, y'all will get it. But it felt very much like Priory of the Orange Tree where you're building up and building up and building up and building up and building up. And then when you finally get to the one scene that actually matters, to the one thing the entire book has been talking about, it takes place in the span of a few pages and then it's done. And it's really not the bulk of the book. And so so it seems that the book is essentially this huge setup without an actual climax that leads to a satisfactory resolution. And not only that, but <laughs> the sequence of events in the book kind of kept reminding me of Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, the movie, where it was very much, we have a quest, we have something to fulfill, we are road tripping and we're going from motel to motel, we are sleeping in the car, we are going to pick up food, and we are just hiding from everybody so that we don't get killed because of this competition that again doesn't even happen in the book and 
Am I just not into road trip stories? Because Survive the Night did the same thing for me, where I absolutely hated it. It was so boring and so monotone. And so for a story that had a very distinct end goal and something very clear that we were building up to, what happened, Shauna? What happened? I have many questions. I do. I really, really do. High key though, and that being said, I think for everybody who didn't enjoy Middle Game, you're gonna love this book. Well, love is just too strong a word, but I think people who didn't like Middle Game run a higher chance of enjoying this book because based on what I've seen, especially with Middle Game being one of my patron book club picks for earlier in the year, there's a lot of people who didn't like the writing style in Middle Game. They thought it was too mystical, too whimsical, just too all over the place in a way that felt a tad bit confusing. Seasonal Fears is very cut and dry. <laughs> <laughs> compared to middle game and it's very straightforward too it doesn't contain that what is even happening element to it that middle game did that i found so fascinating this is just very this is what you get this is what's happening do with that information what you will and stick around to see what happens and so maybe for the people who didn't enjoy middle game this could be something that you could enjoy i don't know if i'd ever recommend this book because i can't deal if middle game ends up being the only good book in the series it's so sad to even think about So, hi. I am tired. I didn't realize how in comparison to a regular 48-hour readathon where, you know, you read and then you watch a movie and then you take breaks, how exhausting and how taxing timing myself for 24 hours was going to be. Like, this is arguably 10 times more exhausting than a regular readathon. It is currently 8.48 p.m. It is Sunday, hello. And we are 22 hours and 46 minutes with 10 seconds into the readathon. So I literally have an hour and 14 minutes left. Never has a readathon felt longer than this, let me tell you that. I am very excited to be done. <laughs> I am very excited for this last hour and 16 minutes. No, 14 minutes. I'm very excited. Also, because I am reading a really good book right now in contrast to season fears which again was not it but i'm currently reading god's jade and shadow by celia moreno garcia and this is giving it all uh, to me i am very much enjoying this and i love i love before i get into the premise the synopsis and everything i just absolutely love how celia moreno garcia regardless of what the book is about just makes sure that her books are infused with mexican culture mexican history in this particular case with mayan mythology it is genuinely so so good and i love also just how all of her books are period pieces so even the atmosphere of the story itself accompanies the time frame so well and more than that the fact that it fits the landscape of latin america so well because i feel when we get stories particularly in the 20s it is very american gaze and so we're used to the flappers and the music and the glamour and all of these fashionable things happening in let's say new york city in here we get the reality of the 20s somewhere else with the american influences yes because i think those are inevitable but we really get this contrast this juxtaposition almost of the 20s in completely different areas and what exactly that means culturally. So I think it's really fascinating. As far as the premise goes, we essentially have our main character who is Cassiopeia Thun. She lives with her grandfather and she is very much abused in her household. Not only is she abused by her grandfather, but also by her cousin Martin. And so she doesn't live very fashionably. She even repeatedly tells her mom, why are we withstanding this behavior? Why are we okay with this? And why is nobody calling this? out because life shouldn't be like this. Life shouldn't feel like this. They are constantly cooking for them. It's very much a patriarchal structure where obviously the women are cooking for the grandfather, for Martin. They're taking care of every need. They are going grocery shopping and they are very much talked down upon. And we can see that even outside of the scope of her household, of her family, how the treatment towards women is very reflective of this time period. And so that essentially is her life at the start of this book. The only reason really why they are staying is because 
the grandfather has told them repeatedly that they are both in his will and they will both inherit a thousand pesos when he dies if they continue to take care of him. In the midst of all of this, there is a lot of mention of a key that her grandfather wears around his neck at all times. The only times he takes it off is when he is showering and when he is going to church. And one day she sees the key just laying there and she gets very curious. She finds out that this key unlocks a chest that is in his bedroom. She uses said key, she opens the chest, and lo and behold, there are bones. Not what she was expecting at all. And it turns out that those were the bones of a Mayan god of death called and a small shard of bone gets into her hand and that essentially is the start, the catalyst, so we call it, of the story because he comes back to life and there is a quest to be fulfilled. They need to find his ear, they need to find his eye, and they need to find his finger in order for him to be at his full extent of his power so that he can fight his brother, another lord of Shibalba, so that he can resume his reign as supreme lord of Shibalba. That is kind of where we're at. It's not that easy though. There are a lot of obstacles in the way. Magicians, ghosts, spirits, demons, the current supreme lord of Shibalba himself. And so it is so, so fascinating. And I think one of my favorite parts of this book honestly has been the Mayan aspect of this all. I am very much enjoying my time learning about Shibalba and about the lords, how everything works, and really just immersing myself in this experience and learning about things that I don't necessarily know. We were taught a lot of Mayan information when I was in school, but we never really got this. And so it has been fascinating also just to somebody who is deeply fascinated by deities and gods and mythology. This is something I'm quite enjoying because it's not very text heavy and it doesn't feel like a history book. So it's very informational, yes, but at the same time, it's very entertaining. So I'm just enjoying the best of both worlds, quite literally. And also Celia Moreno Garcia's ability to infuse history into her stories is one of my favorite parts of her works, both in Mexican Gothic and this. It's just been absolutely incredible because we get to observe once more the Roaring Twenties through the scope of a Latin American country where the disparities are vastly different. And I mean, there's disparities in every country, but I feel the Twenties are often glamorized for something that couldn't necessarily be 100% true. And so Cassiopeia oftentimes mentions how in the city it is one thing and it is glamour and it is fashion and it is automobiles and it is all of these amazing inventions and all of these amazing foods and, and you know, cultural innovations that they get in the city, but then on the outskirts of the country, the treatment is not the same. Even down to women being able to vote, the disparity in comparison to where she lives at the start of the book in Ukumil, it's not the same. And so even those contrasts are absolutely fascinating. And I love the reaffirmation in this book of two things can be true at the same time. And there's a passage of this, which I marked because I needed to read this to you guys. And this in particular is the start of chapter 12. So this is page 110. Mexico City has never inspired much love. At least it's not Mexico City, spills from the lips of anyone who resides outside the capital. A shake of the head accompanying the phrase. Everyone agrees that Mexico City is a vile cesspool, filled with tenements, criminals, and the most indecent lowbrow entertainment available. Paradoxically, everyone also agrees Mexico City exudes a peculiar allure due to its wide avenues and shiny cars, its department stores filled to the brim with fine goods, its movie theaters showing the latest talkies. Heaven and hell both manifest in Mexico City, coexisting side by side. And when I tell you, I I read that and I think I further fell in love with this book because it's just such a constant in the story where we get the main plot line and we get all of the sequences of events which are very fascinating, very much infused with magic, very atmospheric and also very almost romantic in a way because the way that Cassiopeia and Tuncame interact with each other is very charged with chemistry and so in that regard I absolutely love them. But Something that is also true in the story beside the main events that are happening is the fact that Celia Moreno Garcia is constantly talking about the societal structure of the time, about the societal structure of Mexico at the time, about the history surrounding the country, and also tidbits about mythology itself and how people view mythology. I shall now go to hell, she thought, because that was what happened when you looked at a naked man who was not your husband, and this one was handsome. She'd probably burn for all eternity. However, she amended her thought when she recalled that she was in the presence of a god who had spoken about yet another god, which would imply that the priest had been wrong about the Almighty One in heaven. There was no one god in heaven 
been bearded and watching her, but multiple ones. This might mean hell did not exist at all. A sacrilegious notion, which she must no doubt explore later on. And so it's super fascinating because I don't think I had ever read a book that addresses that particular thing. And listen, some people will think I'm a heathen and that's fine. But I personally have always thought that too, especially, you know, growing up religious and slowly trickling out of that life, really just sitting down and thinking if for thousands of years throughout different cultures, there has been the worship of different gods and that that slowly has faded out into what we see nowadays. What will that look like in a hundred years from now, 200 years from now, 500 years from now, a thousand years from now? Let's hope that the world lives long enough to see that. But you know, it's always been there and it's a conversation that I have with my friends all the time about is there really just one as we like to think or is there multiple and they're just laying dormant and also a thing that is addressed in the book is that because people stopped worshiping and because people stopped laying out offerings and because people stopped doing all of these things going to the temples and really adoring the gods and praying to these gods in the way that they used to thousands of years ago they have slowly not necessarily lost their power but they have lost their presence on earth so to say because of the lack of worship and so as far as mythology goes I think it's fascinating. I think also the commentary about being a woman in the 20s has been incredible. And moreover, not only being a woman, but being a brown woman in the 20s and what exactly that signifies in a colorist society. Because when you look at Latin American countries as a whole, there is a lot to be said about countries that have been built on the base of diversity. You know, in Panama in particular, this is a country that was first inhabited fully by indigenous people. We've got the Noves and we've got the Gunas. And so when you look at that as a basis and then you see where everybody has hailed from at the start of one's country. You look at people coming from Africa, you look at people coming from Europe, you look at people coming from, from other Latin American countries, from Asian countries. And so at the end of the day, a lot of Latin American countries are built upon that. They are built on the basis of diversity. And despite that, it's always been a common basis that colorism is still very much a thing. And it fucking sucks that it is because a lot of people shield themselves in the, oh, but I'm Latin, like I can't be racist or I can't be colorist. And I love how she addresses that issue in this book, especially in the section where El Día de los Muertos is happening. And she's like, people congregate for this one celebration and suddenly everybody is equal. But as soon as the celebration is over, people will go back to their usual ways. They will go back to insulting each other and thinking that because their skin color or because their background is different, they are more or they mean less. And so I love how she talks about that and addresses that in her books because it also was something that she addressed in Mexican Gothic because even Cassiopeia's grandfather puts her down for being a brown woman. And not only that, there is also mentions which just absolutely broke my heart about Cassiopeia wishing to have lighter skin and following these sort of recipes or hacks so to call them that could potentially lighten her skin just so that she can be more accepted in society and so reading that is a very jarring experience for some people but it is the reality of what a lot of people have to live and so I love that Silvia Moreno Garcia is kind of pushing through the smokes and mirrors of what oftentimes we see and she really dives deep into every everything that needs to be addressed and she does so wonderfully. It is always a joy to read her books and just see all of those things that typically we don't gaze within a Latin gaze. Silvia Moreno Garcia just gets it. Like she gets it all. And so I love the structure of this. I love how it's written. I love the entirety of the commentary in this. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And honestly, I think it's a great way to close the readathon reading this book, not only because it was short, but also just because the content is very reflective of what I'd expect from an author like Silvia Moreno Garcia. So I'm having a great time. I'm gonna go back to reading this. An hour and 14 minutes left. We're gonna nail this down. We're gonna finish it and we'll see what the end is all about. there. So I finished Gods of Jade and Shadow. Hello. And with time to spare too. It is super late. It's 1.29 a.m. but clock is still running and it is at 23 hours and 56 minutes. So as I talk, I will just let it strike 24 for dramatic effect. I still stand by everything I said. This book is stunning. Can I pan out more? No. Well, 
Maybe if I scoot you back a little bit. Still stand by what I said. It's a beautiful book. I think the commentary in here, historically, culturally, societally, is absolutely beautiful. Not necessarily beautiful, as in like the content is beautiful. I think it just depicts things very accurately and in a way that was very, very satisfying to read as a Latin American person, as a person who lives in Central America and still to this day witnesses a lot of the things that are mentioned in this book because there's a lot of things that still haven't changed, which is very freaking terrible. However, all of that I loved. I loved the Mayan mythology aspect of this. I loved Huncame and I loved his connection to Cassiopeia as the main character. I think there's a lot to be said about him enacting his power as a god of death and really thinking that he has to fulfill all of these roles, all of these ideals because of what he represents. And yet he finds himself, even as he gains humanity through being linked, connected to Cassiopeia, he realizes that humanity is something worth having or compassion is something worth having regardless of what he is representing as a god because death and suffering and all the nasty things in the world are not necessarily the answer a lot of the time. There's a lot of gray area in that too. So I loved the learnings that he had to go through at the end of the story. I think I would have loved to see him after the fact, like after the descent, just to see exactly what happens to him afterwards instead of not getting to see it because it, it feels like a moot point almost to say that everything's going to happen in a certain way but then we don't get to observe if it does which is why and I'm, I'm trying to like talk in code for people who haven't read the book but I genuinely think that the only thing playing against this book is the ending. I think the ending was rushed and I mean it's not blame the book but like also kind of yes. The book is just short and so how many pages do you really have to execute an ending in the scope of what Celia Moreno Garcia was attempting to do? I wish we would have gotten maybe 50 more pages. I think that would have been perfect because the book is 334. If this book would have been 380 pages, I think that would have been perfect. But everything else, I absolutely love. I loved the rivalry between Hunkame and his brother. I believe if I just play it off my brain, it's pronounced Vukubkame, maybe. I don't know if I'm butchering that or not. I'm trying my best. But the rivalry between the two and just Cassiopeia's analysis of it all saying, well, maybe the reason why he doesn't want you to come back and be the ruler of it all is because maybe you were cruel and maybe you were terrible and maybe he does hold that against you. And it's not necessarily because he wants all of the power in the world or because he wants people to worship him again, but maybe it's because he just doesn't think that you are deserving of the role that you had because of how you were acting. If you do take up the mantle of support Supreme Lord again, will you be any different than your brother or will you just make things worse? And I love the questioning of that and how it plays into the whole ending of this book. I think it really came full circle. And also with Cassiopeia and Martin, who is her cousin, with him even saying like, I, I genuinely wanted to like you and I was excited to meet you when, you know, when you arrived in Ukumil. But then I overheard grandfather telling you, if only you had been a boy. And that's when I, as in Martin, that's when I understood that I would never amount to the same as you would amount to, which is so interesting from his perspective and how he sort of internalizes that. Because even if he thinks that, in the landscape that this is set in, in the time frame that this is set in, and based on how Cassiopeia is treated, she will always quote unquote amount to less than him. And so it, it's really just interesting to always see how people internalize all of these ideas, all of these thoughts, despite them not being necessarily true. It's just, fascinating. So overall, I think this was a fantastic book. I'm giving it four stars. If only the ending would have been better, this would have been a five star, but I do have to cut it back because of the ending because I wanted just a little bit more. And that being said, we hit the full 24 hours. 24 hours officially and two minutes. That, I'm gonna screenshot this because this is absolutely wild. That's wild, you guys. And honestly, it's timing this has just shown that I am not reading slower. <laughs> just procrastinating a lot during readathons. I felt the pace in this readathon was much more akin to the pace I had on readathons like two years ago. So it really is just me procrastinating, which is fascinating to see. And I'm glad I did this. I am glad we did this experiment to see how much I could read in 24 hours. I'm sure if I would have just been a little bit more lenient with myself and instead of saying, I'm gonna do this in three days, and instead I would have said, I'm gonna do this in four or five days, I know 
know I would have been able to finish my entire TBR, including the Maidens, which is a crazy thing to say. All Roads Lead here is over 500 pages. Seasonal Fears is almost 500 pages. So between those, if we combine those two, we have a thousand, a little bit over a thousand pages. And then this, which is 334. So I read almost 1400 pages in 24 hours, which is so wild. I've been procrastinating this whole time. But yes, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. That is all that I have for you guys today. I say all as if this is just like the most minimal thing ever. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you did, give it a massive thumbs up down below. And also comment down below if you've read any of the books that I mentioned in this video. I'll probably still read The Maiden soon because I did check it out from Libby. So I still do have it. So maybe I'll read it this month before the month is over. So let me know if you've read any of these. And what did you read this past weekend? What are you up to reading wise? Let a girl know. I would be very interested to find that out. And don't forget to subscribe down below if you haven't done so already. I am constantly uploading videos and I am sure you do not want to miss. And if you want more content from me, if you want sprints, live shows, exclusive videos, a Discord server, a book club, and just all of the good stuff. Well, it's double book club actually because I host two book clubs over on Patreon. I do have a Patreon and it's always linked down below and it's always a great time over there. So that is always linked down below alongside all of my social media. And yes, I love you guys so much and I shall see you on the next one. Bye guys.